We're back, and I gotta tell you, we're fixing to we're fixing to hear from a guy that I've long considered a friend. Of course, he won't return my calls, but he's still a friend, and he's one of the finest writers I've ever known. John Woolley is here. We're gonna be talking about two books hot off the press. John, it's good to see you, my friend. Sam, it's good to see you too. Thanks a lot for having me on. How are you doing? You all right? Doing fine. Yep. Yeah. Out in the country. Luckily, I've uh, got a job that uh, enables me to work from home. So uh, very blessed to, to have a lot of work do it to do. And it's, yeah, it's been great. Well, I've got a little minor complaint. Uh oh. So let me get it out of the way. Please and we'll do. talk about the first book in doing it. This is uh, Sinister Serpent. Yes. The Cleansing. Mm -hmm. That's book three. Folks, mm -hmm. I'm going to hold this up where you can see it. This is one of the latest from John. John, I have book one, I have book three, I don't have book two, did I miss much? No, but if your uh, viewers don't mind, I'll go ahead and summarize the story for you right now. No, I'll be glad to get you that second book so you can make it all work. I, you know, I'd like for it to go together because I got this gap. Right. And I'm, I'm going, what, what, what? Well, but you know. I got to tell you, the first one moved me, man. I mean, there was a lot of fun in that book. Thank you, Sam. I appreciate that. It's uh, we're getting some really good reviews from it. It's as you know, it's epistolary. It's told yeah. in uh, uh, told in, in in letters, and uh, uh, exclusively. And a lot of people seem to enjoy that way of telling the story. Set 1939, and uh, and I wrote it with a friend of mine named Robert Brown, and uh, we've talked about doing books together for years. We're both pulp magazine fans, fans of the old weird tales pulp and that sort of thing. And so uh, we decided we'd just go ahead and do it. And uh, we ended up with about 120,000 words. So that's why it's in three volumes. Holy Toledo. Well, you've done it again. I mean, is this the last book of the series? That is the final book of the trilogy, the last book of the series. Yes, sir. You know, just Sam's observation here, but there's a movie here. I'd like to think so. Uh, and it's it's bad enough to scare the ugly off my brother. <laughs> I mean, that's that's the kind of stuff that uh, that's the way it reads. And I got it. And it's such an easy flow, John. You're one of the more talented men I've ever known. Well, thank you, Sam. That's great. And that's that's what we tried for. We tried for a you know a very fluid way of intimate way of telling the story and again hearkening back to the old pulps we just wanted there is some subtext there as you well know uh to hang it on but we just wanted to 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 tell the kind of a story that was was told back in the pulp magazines of the 1930s okay again folks this is the book sinister servant and it is a winner by john woolley the cleansing book three i can't speak intelligently about book two, but I will. <laughs> yes. We'll get John back over here. Now, you've also done something, John, that rolled my socks and my pantyhose up and down. <laughs> uh, I don't know how actually to get into this because I'm, I'm, I'm a I'm confirmed fan of yours now for the rest of my life. This is the book, 20th Century Honky Tonk. The story of Kane's ballroom. I picked this thing up, started to read it, could not put it down. Um, I, I, I first of all, I don't know how you got through all the legal entanglements that had to be involved in doing this. There had to be either you've got a great lawyer, or you negotiate well. Tell me about that. <laughs> well, how did the research come together? The research came together. You know, we've got my co-writer on that is Brett Bingham, and he's the manager now of Bob Wills Texas Playboys, and he goes way back. His uh, his uncle Ray Bingham, of course, has been booking uh, acts around uh, this part of the country for many, many years, and in fact, all over the country, and worked with Leon McAuliffe back in the '60s, worked with Johnny Lee Wills, and and so many different people. And so I had Brett to help me on that, and Brett knew a lot of the people because he's a collector of Bob Wills material, and Bob Wills and Johnny Lee Wills. And so we had that going for us, and Brett had a lot of people he knew who could supply some of the, the missing parts that we had from back in those days when, when Bob Wills uh, really put the Canes Ballroom on the map back around 1935. I got to stop just a minute and ask you, do they keep 
a ghost light on stage at Canes? You know, I think they used to, honestly, Sam. I don't think so. I don't think so anymore. Although there are people, as you know from the book, who uh, have seen uh, ghosts. One of them being Larry Schaefer, uh, the owner of the yeah. Canes Ballroom for so many years, uh, being in there at 3 a.m. and hearing a big ruckus and, and opening the door, and uh, nobody on stage, just the voices. You got to realize, folks, that uh, there was a time when Keynes was the gathering place for, for the Tulsa Sound, or what would become the Tulsa Sound. And, <clears throat> pardon me, over the years, so many men and women, performers, writers, music writers, passed through the doors. Uh, their spirits are in the walls. I'm convinced of this, John. Mm -hmm. And you've captured all of that in this book. Oh, well, thank you, Sam. I really appreciate that. I think we we have, we you know, I spent, of course, at the Tulsa World for 23 years writing entertainment. I spent a lot of time at the Canes Ballroom. Uh, Larry Schaefer's a friend of mine, and uh, he was very forthcoming with both, both Brett and me about it. And we really tried to capture what it must have been. And it's really, there's another book to be written, because this is only the first 75 years, but it broke down very nicely into 50 years of basically country music and then 25 years of, of rock and roll and a lot of different other kinds of music. And uh, it started in, uh, in, in 75 years when, uh, when Tate Brady built it in 1923. And uh, we go from 1923 to 19, uh, 1990, or I'm sorry, 1924 to 1999. So we've got 75 years, the first 75 years of it. This is not just a book on a ballroom. This is a chunk of history, John. And what you've done here should have been done many years back, and you did it with finesse and style. Well, thank and it, you. It just absolutely captured my attention. And well, for the benefit you. of you folks that are watching, who are new to the area perhaps, maybe you don't know much about the Tulsa sound, you don't know much about music uh, from this neck of the woods, Kane's Ballroom is where it, is where it came from. Uh, Absolutely. Anybody, anybody who's anybody knows that jazz came up stream, if you will, from New Orleans, headed for Chicago, but it passed a lot of it passed through Tulsa. Mm -hmm. A lot of the folks stopped off, played here, and moved on. Mm -hmm. Some of them stayed for a long, long time. But we've had folks walk in with a git fiddle and a, a string and a, a broom handle and a wash tub who could knock your socks off <laughs> and and the original musicians that just packed Kane's ballroom. This is before air conditioning and God knows it was before the pandemic. <laughs> That's right. And it wasn't until the early fifties, if I'm remembering right, that Mr. O.W. Mayo, who owned the ballroom at the time, put in what he called washed air. You remember that, Sam, that old uh, evaporative I cooler? I grew up with him. You probably did, too. And before that, there was just nothing except open windows. My grandparents uh, over in Fort Smith had a little mom-and-pop grocery store and had one of those coolers. Mm -hmm. And people would come in just to see it, you know, some of their customers. And, I mean, that was a cat's pajamas for a long time. <laughs> it was. Uh, that, that was really a big deal. <laughs> John, what did you learn putting this book together? What came screaming out at you? I think I learned, even though going in, I was pretty aware of the place that the Canes Ballroom had in certainly our popular culture, Sam, around here in Oklahoma and in, indeed the whole area. And I knew that because of the old KVOO AM's clear channel, 50,000 watts, that it got to a lot of places. Uh, and so I knew that about the three-legged stool when Bob Wills of Texas Playboys came in, sort of broadcasting over KVOO from Canes, that those three things started the musical style known as Western Swing. But I think what I didn't know was just how important it was, not just regionally and not even just nationally. Our publisher tells us, which is, uh, which is uh, uh, Bill Bernhardt tells us, that uh, we're getting a lot of orders from stores in Australia, from Great Britain. Really? Uh, yes, uh, that, uh, the, that the book, uh, The Canes Ballroom, the fame of The Canes Ballroom, is such that it's, it's worldwide. It's not just local or not just regional. 
And I think that was one of the most surprising things of all to me, just, just the, the, the reach of the Canes Ballroom and the effect that it's had on musicians and on music lovers. You know, I never, of course, knew Bob Wills, but uh, Leon McCullough was a good friend. Uh, he and I had dinner together. In fact, I remember one night at his house here in Tulsa, um, we were, our wives were in another part of the house and Leon and I were out in the den talking and he was talking to me about episodes, you know, that, that occurred with Bob when he played with Bob Wills. And he said, you know, it's kind of funny. And he went off into this story, which was captivating in itself. But the whole time he was talking to me, there was a steel guitar uh, resting on top of a pool table. And he's playing music from back then that should have been upbeat and fast, which you would think. And it was quiet and soft. And the steel guitar wasn't plugged in, but you could still tell what it was. Mm -hmm. Never will forget he did that. And I was blessed to be able to be you know, in, in his presence when he did. One of those things you carry with you forever. There's a segment in the book where you mention some of the things that Keynes housed. Mm -hmm. I think it was a dance school at one time. It was, and the old timers, you remember Sam used to call it Keynes Academy of Dance. Yeah. And that's because of Madison Kane, and that goes clear back uh, to the 20s when Madison Kane was a dance instructor and he'd study with Vernon and Irene Castle up in New York and knew all the latest dance steps. Well, this was a time when the oil men and their wives were uh, looking for different cultural things and the wives all wanted to learn the latest dance steps. And so a guy like Madison Kane would sort of follow the oil money. He had places in Drumright, he had places in Oklahoma City before he ended up at the Canes. And, and in fact, uh, the Canes is named after Madison, Madison Kane, uh, who took it over after uh, it was, it, before that it was called the Louvre for some reason or another. We were never able to find out why a dance hall had been named after a famous Paris art museum, uh, <laughs> but it had been by, uh, by Tate Brady. And, uh, and uh, Madison Kane, Daddy Kane, bought the estate from Tate Brady and turned it into a dance studio called the Kane's Academy of Dance. And that's why the old timers would say, well, going to Kane's Academy, because that's what the name of it was. Ten cents a dance. Yes, ten cents a dance. There were dime a dance things going on there at that time, taxi dancing or jitney dancing, uh, where you could go in and get a ticket and, uh, and dance with someone. And then there were the actual dance lessons that Madison Kane and Howard Turner, his right-hand man, gave. And, uh, and then they would rent it out occasionally for uh, concerts or for dances. Uh, and that's how Bob Wills and O.W. Mayo found it on New Year's uh, Day, 1935. That's the first time Bob Wills and the Texas Playboys came to the Kane's Ballroom playing for, I believe, Morning Star and Morning Side. I always get it mixed up, Nurses Association. And they, they played for that, and they had been playing in a place called the Playmore Ballroom, which was a second story thing over a garage. And they looked at this Kane's Ballroom and thought, this is great, let's see if we can't get in here. And that's when that whole thing started with Bob Wills and the Texas Playboys linking up with the Kane's Ballroom. I, there's, we're fast running out of time, John. I gotta get this in right quickly. There's a place in the book uh, you're talking about, uh, Bob went over to, he, he noticed some of the patrons were disappearing and went over and turned out that the lady in charge said, look, we don't allow just anybody to stumble in here. And Bob said something to the effect of, you better let them stumble in. They're the one that buys records. They buy the tickets. They move the music. That's it, right. I mean, there's so much insight to this book. John, we're out of time. Thank you, my friend, for being here. Sam, it means thank the world. You. Oh, listen, it's always great to talk to you. Thank you so much. More on this down the road. Now, if you won't do it for yourself, do it for somebody you love. Put on that mask, avoid crowds, and for God's sake, be safe out there, all right? For now, good night. <laughs>